Did you ever look at the labels on commonly used items and wonder why they have the warnings that they do? So, for example, the vanishing fabric, mark, fabric marker should not be used as a writing instrument for signing checks or any legal documents as signatures will fade or disappear completely. Or something like this one. Do not drive with sunshield in place. Whenever I read those, I think to myself, what happened that caused them to feel it necessary to put that label on that particular item? Because at some point, somebody did something and it caused them to have to put that warning on there. It's with all of that in mind that we're going to be diving into a video today that on the surface might not seem like it has a lot to do with that. But it's called Major Disasters That Changed History. And uh, it's from the channel Weird History. I'll put a link down in the description. And the reason I shared that as an introduction is because a lot of times the things that we take for granted have always been a part of our lives. They happened because of something that happened. For example, the fact that all ships are required to have enough lifeboats for every passenger uh, on board. We know happened because of Titanic and the reforms that happened because of the aftermath of that disaster. A lot of times, disasters lead to changes that make things safer, that make people safer. And so we're going to take a look at some disasters today throughout history, some of which had major impacts on the world we live in today and why we do things the way that we do. A lot of times it's because of something that happened bad to someone else so our lives could be easier. So uh, let's check this out. I hope you enjoy it. If you have recommendations of other types of videos from Weird History or other channels like it you want me to check out, please consider doing that. Also, we're now doing regular content on VTH Extra. So if you haven't already subscribed to VTH Extra, there's a link down in the description as well as a link to my gaming channel. Hoping to do more content on both of those channels in 2024. Let's dive in. Disasters as if they're a bad thing. And that's fair because they are. But it doesn't change the fact that human history has, to a remarkable extent, been shaped by natural disasters. So, today, we're going to take a look at major disasters that changed history in unexpected ways. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other historical calamities you'd like to hear about. Okay, time to get your masters in disasters. Hmm. If you know one thing about volcanoes, it's probably that they're mountains with holes at the top that shoot lava out. But if you know two things about them, good for you, it's that they're among the most devastating forces on Earth. And if you knew three things about volcanoes, it would be that baking soda and vinegar do not mix well. <laughs> He's referring to uh, how people would make volcanoes as a school project. The funny thing about volcanoes, though, is everybody thinks about lava, but lava is very often not the thing that kills people in volcanic eruptions. It's something called pyroclastic flow, which is this superheated, dense cloud that you often see rolling down uh, from volcanoes. Um, and if you see a great example of that in the movie Dante's Peak, they show what pyroclastic flow can do. Uh, it's a lot of times it's that that kills people. That's what killed people, say, at Mount St. Helens uh, that erupted in the northwestern United States. It wasn't lava that flowed out slowly and burned everyone to death. It was the pyroclastic flow. It's the rocks that get shot out. It's the heat and the dust and the ash. They're so much more devastating than just lava from volcanoes. The 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia, the deadliest eruption in human history, was a truly cataclysmic event, estimated to have slain 100,000 people during its initial blast alone. But it wasn't long before its impact was felt across the globe. In addition to causing a weather disturbance that lasted three years, it also led to numerous crop failures. And as if all that wasn't enough, a new strain of cholera formed mm. in the Bay of Bengal, enabled by the reduced temperatures caused by the eruption. Soon it was spreading across the world, claiming tens of millions of lives. Real smooth, Mount Tambora. Real smooth. Mm. Few pandemics have been as devastating as the Black Death, but sometimes you just have to try and look on the bright side. The bright side in this case starts with the Black Death consuming Europe in the 14th century, burning through both peasants and princesses alike. Okay, that doesn't sound particularly bright, 
but the plague took out so many people that numerous fundamental aspects of life in Europe had to be completely yeah. reshaped in its way, and many of the changes were actually pretty good. For example, the Black Death created a remarkable labor shortage. That sounds like a bad thing, but recent research has demonstrated that the shortage gave greater economic and political agency to all the still living laborers. So, good for you. You're one of the 50% or 60% of the people in Europe who survived the plague. So look at all the new opportunities that are now available for you. I mean, we've all just gone through a global pandemic. Uh, that didn't kill anywhere near the number of people that the plague did or even that the Spanish flu did 100 years ago. Um, but think about how our lives were disrupted. But imagine for a second if in the span of a real short time, half of all the people in your community are dead, are gone. Not only do you have to deal with the logistical issues of disposing of the bodies and the health concerns and the people who survived that you have to take care of. But now half of the people who worked at Walmart are gone and half the people who uh, ran the electric department are gone and half the people who worked in government are gone. Half your police officers are gone. Half your teachers are gone. All of it, it completely upends society. And that was the case. It took hundreds of years for places like England to recover from the losses that happened because of this plague. And it's, it's unfortunate when you think about it now because you could fly back in time with some simple antibiotics and kill the thing like that. But, of course, they didn't know that at the time. Particularly serfs. They soon began to agitate for better working conditions. And in those areas that had been most potently affected by the Black Death, the long-standing institution of serfdom began to crumble. So if you're grateful that you're not a serf, remember to thank the good old Black Death. But not in person, maybe just send an email. Before COVID-19 stole its thunder, the Spanish flu was arguably the pandemic most people thought of when they thought of pandemics. Yeah. The disease ravaged the globe from 1918 to 1919, ultimately taking the lives of 50 million people and infecting many, many more. The disease yeah, it may have killed as many as 5% of the world's population. The estimates are really hard to come by because so often the records don't necessarily record exactly why people died. And people didn't necessarily always die of the flu itself, but of secondary effects of having the flu, like in like uh, pneumonia, for example. Um, and there's a lot of different ways it got described. Spanish flu is an unfortunate way of describing it because the, the first reported known outbreaks came from North America, uh, Canada, and the United States. And we're probably the main cause of why it spread. It, uh, there was an outbreak in Kansas. Soldiers took it to the Western Front. It spread like wildfire. And then, of course, the war ended and all those soldiers went home and brought it with them. Spain was one of the only countries that was open and honest about what was happening. And so they, they got the name, even though it didn't come from them. These also seems to have impacted those who were born shortly thereafter. Though it wouldn't become clear until many years after the flu abated, those who were born in 1919 were significantly more likely to develop heart disease and diabetes hmm. in later years. It's also been postulated that the flu somehow triggered an outbreak of encephalitis lethargica, a bewildering sleeping sickness that emerged during the same time period. No direct link has been found, but the Spanish flu was a first-class a-hole. So, so it, it's tough because there were because we had the Great War going on at the same time, one of the most devastating wars in human history. Uh, so it's hard to know what you can attribute psychologically to one versus the other, and and how much of what happened in the aftermath is due to one versus the other because they kind of overlap. But imagine living in that time period. Imagine being someone who was born in 1900. You are born into a time of horse and buggies where automobiles have just been invented and are just becoming a thing. Uh, you're born into a time when the airplane is invented when you're a child. You have a devastating world war as a teenager and then a global pandemic that kills millions of people across the world when you're becoming an adult. Uh, and then you have the Roaring Twenties, and then you have the stock market crash and the Great Depression in the 30s, and then you have an even more devastating world war in the 40s, and then in your 50s you have the Cold War and the space race and uh, nuclear weapons, 
and then you get into all the assassinations of the 60s. Man, the world was a scary place. We wouldn't put something like this past it. Hmm. The Fans Crown the covers. Series, the- if you've ever seen the TV show The Crown, they do a whole episode on this. Crown will no doubt remember oh. the Great Smog, a yeah. key plot element in the first season episode, Act of God. Unless you put the crown on in the background to Netflix and Snog. For everyone who didn't pay attention to that episode, a combination of weather patterns and the extensive use of coal led to a blanket of pollution lying over much of London, resulting in widespread health problems and death among its inhabitants. Yep. In short, the Great Smog was a terrible way to see out the year 1952, and you have to wonder why they didn't call it the not-so-great smog. For many Londoners, using coal was a symbolic act as well as a practical one, because it tied into the notion of the hearth and home, an ideal that was particularly important Mm. in the troubling decades after World War II. Luckily, with the war being over, people could stop pretending the smog didn't bother them, and numerous environmental regulations regarding the usage of coal were put into place in subsequent decades. So that's a great example of an event that most people don't talk about, but that had ramifications on environmental uh, rules and regulations that help clear up the air, you know, so to speak. This one's a huge one, and this is a horrible, horrible disaster, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, uh, that had major ramifications for businesses in the United States especially. Though it lasted for less than 20 minutes, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire would have tremendous consequences for American labor. Yeah. You know, in addition to the consequences experienced by all the people caught in the fire. What started out as a small blaze soon engulfed the entire building, and because labor laws of the day were draconian to the point of cruelty, the doors had been locked in order to prevent workers from leaving on unauthorized breaks. The results were predictably catastrophic. Many workers who weren't outright engulfed by the flames jumped to their dooms trying to escape. The fire would have a significant impact on Francis Perkins, who witnessed the fire and later became Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Secretary of Labor, making her the first woman to hold a cabinet position. When she came to Washington, she would become a tireless advocate for the rights of workers and a key voice in the creation of social security, which would itself fundamentally transform the relationship of American citizens to their government. So let's talk for just a minute about some of the specific regulations that came out of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire uh, disaster. So, number one, uh, this is a place where they're working with a lot of fabric, and there's literally thousands of fabric cuttings that were laying all over the place. And somebody, they suspect, threw a uh, cigarette into a, a trash bin that had a bunch of these things in it, and it, of course, caught on fire. Literally everything in that room was flammable at that point, and so it caught on fire instantly. Of course, you have the... Uh, uh, the problem of people not being able to escape because of the locked doors. You had 62 people who either jumped or fell from windows uh, because of things. And of course, so, of course, you didn't have ways for them to escape from the building. Uh, so these are, of course, just a few examples of things. The death tolls anywhere from 141 to 148. Uh, most victims died of burns, asphyxiation, blunt impact injuries, or a combination of the three. Uh, so just a few examples of some of the things that people were dealing with from that. Uh, so as a result of the fire, the American Society of Safety Professionals was founded in New York City in 1911. Uh, and there were all kinds of things that came out of this. Uh, they inspected uh, factories uh, to make sure that they were in compliance with things moving forward. Uh, and, and there are all kinds of labor reform, including laws mandating better building access and egress from those buildings, uh, fireproofing requirements for buildings, the availability of fire extinguishers. Because remember, this started as a small fire. Uh, installation of alarm systems and automatic sprinklers, better eating and toilet facilities for workers, a limiting of the number of hours that women and children could work. Uh, 60 of the 64 new laws that were recommended by the commission uh, during this time as a result of those events were passed. Uh, So 60 laws regulating business that help make for a safer situation so that something like that wouldn't happen again. Also, when's the last time you heard of someone wearing a shirtwaist? I guess they all went up in the blaze. Hmm. 
The Johnston Flood, also known as the Great Flood of 1889, is one of the most devastating floods to have occurred in the United States. It claimed the lives of over 2,000 people and resulted in millions of dollars in damage. The residents of the Pennsylvania town faced an uphill battle against the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club, which had made changes to a dam that reduced the dam's effectiveness and caused the flood. However, the club... So specifically, what happened was this was a... uh, This was during the time when you have people that are kind of known as the robber barons, you know, the Andrew Carnegie's and JP Morgan's of the world. And Pittsburgh is one of the centers of industry at this time. And Johnstown is a couple hours outside of Pittsburgh. It's east of the city. Uh, And so a lot of these very wealthy uh, people in the Gilded Age are going to the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. uh, And they have homes there along the shore of this lake, this man-made reservoir that has been built with this dam. And they wanted to be able to fish, and so they were putting fish into it, but the fish were escaping uh, because this dam had been built up to dam up a creek, and so you had to have a way for the water to flow from the, the, the lake that had been built up to keep the creek going, but the fish were all escaping. And so they were putting these grates in on the one end of the dam where, where the spillway was, where the water would go out of in order for the fish to be held into the lake and not be able to get through. But it also meant that any debris that was in the water would get caught there and it would block that and it would cause the water to rise. Uh, And so when you get a devastatingly strong level of rain in a short period of time that causes the water to rise even more, and there were a lot of other factors as well, Uh, one of the other systems that had been built to help uh, take the water out had been destroyed in a fire and never rebuilt there were just a lot of neglect that happened and a lot of the blame got placed on these wealthy people who had basically neglected to upkeep things and had caused the situation and endangered the people who were downriver from this dam Uh, And there are also factors of warning time and things like that. And just a lot of things went wrong to cause this. And it was just a horrible, horrible disaster. The club was not found to be liable for any of the damage, which ultimately didn't matter because the club didn't have any assets it could have used to pay for any of the damages anyway. Though almost all of the suits failed, there was an unexpected result. The significant public outrage led to a major shift in American law. Rather than a fault-based system, The law would now be based on strict liability, which makes it easier to hold people accountable for the results of their actions. So, yeah, think about the difference between did you cause this directly versus are you responsible for what happened? And that is a very big difference. These people that ran this club did not cause the dam. Like they didn't go and do something to intentionally cause the collapse of that dam. But their neglect and their decisions over the years leading up to it were directly responsible for the collapse of the dam. So liability is a factor there. I did a video early on before I even had vlogging through history when I was still doing videos for my gaming channel. Uh, I did a video from the site of the Johnstown Flood. I would like to go back and revisit that and redo that video and tell that story again. Um, so I, I will put a link in the, uh, in the, uh, on the end screen at the end of this video so you can watch that. Just understand it's, it's a long time ago and it wasn't my best work and the quality is not fantastic, but it is a great way to learn the story. Whether or not such actions were done with criminal intent, in other words, but we didn't mean to flood your town is no longer a viable excuse. Yep. The infamous Irish potato famine, the result of a blight that affected potatoes throughout Europe, was one of the most significant events in 19th mm. century Irish history, fundamentally changing many aspects of the country's culture and society. Yeah. One of the most significant impacts of the famine was the immigration of many Irish people to other parts of the world, including the United States. For example, in one of those fun parts of history, the famine would ultimately give rise to one of the most powerful and influential political dynasties in United States history, the Kennedys. John F. Kennedy and his brothers were descended from the Irish on both sides. Their mother's family, the Fitzgeralds, had actually left Ireland largely as a result of the famine. Without the famine, it's entirely possible the Kennedy family would never have become this powerful and influential in American politics. That's the luck of the Irish for you, except not just that, but uh, I mean, obviously we think of it as a tragedy, but there were some very intentional decisions made in the British government that led to this disaster. 
Um, it's a whole story. I mean, we did a, I did a series on this uh, a while back telling the story of the potato famine, and it's well worth your time to check it out. Um, but, yeah, I, Ireland, the population on the island of Ireland, both the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland together, is just now nearly 200 years later, getting back to the place it was before the potato famine. Between the people who died and the people who left, they're just now getting back to that population. That's how devastating that time was to their country. The part about the famine and everything that happened to the Kennedys in the 60s. Hmm. San Francisco has endured a significant number of seismic effects during its history, mostly due to the city's location along the San Andreas Fault, but also thanks to some incredible seasons from the 49ers. Am I right, guys? Owners of the 49ers live here in the same town as me. I had talk about it all the time. They also own the uh, they own Leeds United, uh, who my team West Brom I think play tomorrow. Oh man! Um, but yeah, they live just right down the street from me. Back to earthquakes. A seismic 1906 quake led to major property damage and significant loss of life. However, the impact of the damage soon spread beyond San Francisco. Of particular importance was the amount of money paid out by British insurance companies to hmm. their customers in California. This, in turn, led to significant financial strain, the Knickerbocker Trust Company crisis, and the subsequent panic of 1907. We had extremely cute names for very serious things back then. The resulting financial chaos led to an increased demand for an overhaul of the financial system and, after several pieces of legislation, the founding of the Federal Reserve. Hmm. In other words, the 1906 earthquake was so strong it shook the whole economy and founded a new government entity. Yeah. But did it win five Super Bowl championships between 1981 and 1994? No. Joe Montana and Steve Young. can make that claim. In the United States, the 1930s mm. was a period of profound trauma and really awesome swing music, so we'll call it a draw? In addition to the terrible economic conditions imposed by the Great Depression, many of those living in the Great Plains were forced to move by the Dust Bowl, which saw topsoil stripped by high winds and vicious dust storms, screwing up the country's entire agricultural system for good measure, mm. or bad measure. Along with the Depression, the Dust Bowl required government intervention to combat the crushing weight of poverty. The Works Progress Administration would come to employ many in various professions, including as artists. Yeah, so if you ever see WPA, that's the Works Progress Administration. It's one of a number of things that came out of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. This is also an interesting time because this is a time when farming has gone from being something that local people did as subsistence farmers, which meant you were farming so that you had crops to feed your family. And if you had a little bit extra, maybe you traded some of it, sold some of it to make some some money here. But for the most part, you weren't doing it as a business. By the 1930s, a lot of the farms, especially out in the Great Plains, are much more the business side of things. And they're feeding not just their families, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of other families. Uh, so the Dust Bowl not only impacted those families directly, it impacted the entire country. For example, the works of such renowned photographers as Dorothea Lang paint a vivid and haunting portrait of American mm. life in the 1930s. Yeah. Consequently, this became one of the most well-documented periods in American history. That's art from adversity for mm. you. And we haven't even mentioned John Steinbeck's classic novel, The Grapes of Wrath, which follows a family displaced by the Dust Bowl to California in search of the new American dream. Mm. Oh, wait, we just did. So, yeah, one of the other things that does then is that it drives a lot of people out of farming which, much like when we talked about the plague, how not having people doing a job can hurt you, well, suddenly now you're going to see the government subsidizing a lot of farmers. And to this day, farming is heavily subsidized by the government because we need people making food because most of us aren't making food. I'm not farming out in my backyard making crops to feed my family. I'm buying it at the grocery store. Well, it's got to come from somewhere, and you've got to make that financially viable for people, or they're not going to do it anymore. The Coconut Grove nightclub sounds like a fun, fun place until you add the word fire to the end of it. Occurring in 1942 in Boston, the Coconut Grove nightclub fire killed almost 500 people. Wow. If that sounds like too many people for a nightclub, hey, you're right. So what happened? Well, the club was incredibly overcrowded and there was only one exit, making it almost impossible for many people to escape. I would love to think that this helped move things along in the right direction, but we know that we had a similar thing happen 
in the eastern United States just in the last couple of decades uh, with a fire that killed a lot of people. However, as is so often the case with these terrible events, there was an unexpected societal benefit. The hospitals where the victims were taken perfected strategies for dealing with traumatic burn injuries. Mm. At Mass General in particular, the hospital went against common medical wisdom of the time and covered the burns rather than attempting to remove damaged tissue. This practice proved to be effective in reducing infection, and it would set the stage for many other advancements in the care of wow. serious burns. That said, it probably didn't do much for the nightlife industry. Come to the place that revolutionized burn treatment is a much harder sell than ladies' night. So what do you think? Which of these... That was interesting, uh, and there's a lot more like that. Uh, in fact, let's keep the conversation going down in the description. What's another example from history of where some disaster, some trauma, some horrible event led to important changes that have benefited society since then and that we are benefiting from even to this day? Let's talk about that in the comment section below. I'll throw up a couple of those links I talked about on the screen for you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.